Okay. Well, good afternoon, students. Thank you for joining today. We're very happy to have you for our research centered career meetup as part of our healthcare science and research community week. So we have Damian Bisek here with us. He's very nice to do this for us to talk about looking for undergraduate research. A lot of tips here to be thrown at you. He's a PhD candidate in the nanoscale science group and looks to graduate this summer, which is a huge deal. So congratulations. So I'll turn it over to you, Damian. Thanks for being here. And thanks to you students for joining for educational opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here and also welcome everybody and thank you for showing up. So my name's Damian. Currently, I'm a PhD student in Dr. Fonin's lab. Uh, we do molecular molecular biology research in the chemistry department. So a lot of my advice and a lot of my perspective is going to be from the chemistry department. I do have some experience uh, for my master's degree through the engineering department here at UNC Charlotte. Uh, and I can kind of speak on both of those types of experiences and both of those, uh, uh, both of the my chances of interacting with undergrads. So I'll just start with my undergraduate research experience. Uh, for me personally, uh, I did my bachelor's in physics at Syracuse University, and I was able to uh, get three years of undergraduate research experience. And I definitely can like talk about some of the differences between the two universities. Uh, in undergrad, uh, our faculty student to faculty ratio was really great there were 50 faculty on campus and then 50 declared physics majors on campus at least at my time i'm sure like things have changed since i've graduated but it was a really good ratio if there was a declared physics major you kind of had a lot of choices all you had to do was uh, visit your professor's office and talk about what they had because that was a place there was more opportunity than there were people and there was plenty of funding it was we were a big particle physics school. And my personal story, uh, I was taking a biophysics class. I really enjoyed the professor. I liked the class. I followed along really well. So I just visited him during his office hours. He probably thought I was going to ask him questions about like the homework assignment for the day. But uh, I asked him, like, what what does he do in his lab? What uh, like does he have any projects? Uh, does he have any projects available for undergrads? Like, do his re or his uh, graduate students do they need any help? So we had a long conversation about that, and he ended up coming up with an idea for the summer. So I didn't get to start in the lab until like the spring semester was over. But he had some things lined up, and he had a perfect project for an undergrad to work on independently. And so I spent uh, three years working on. Uh, project by myself under my uh, advisor, Dr. Forstner. And we ended up having it published and presented at the American Physical Society. So I had a publication that I could go into and apply to graduate schools and say, like, put that on my resume and be able to advertise. I've already done research. Like, please accept me into another graduate program so I can do more research. And so my experience here at UNC Charlotte, like I said, I was in uh, the engineering department uh, doing my master's degree. And with the engineering department, some of you are probably familiar with this, but uh, you need junior design, you have to have a junior design project and a senior design project. So I was able to uh, help out five different senior design students and help them with their project and mentor them for that. So essentially, I just trained them on all of our basic lab techniques. Uh, we were a lab that did ceramic processing for 3D printing and optics and things like that. But uh, I trained them on the basic ways to uh, like produce the material and how to treat it. And then uh, basically characterize the parameters that you measure afterwards. But it was a lot of basic training. And like I helped come up with the experiments, but it was mostly the students running it uh because that's the that's the big thing is you have to prove to people that you can come up with your own experiments and kind of explore the material rather than just produce it 
So uh, when you're when you're doing research, when you're doing experiments, like any lab technician, they can do all the bench work, they can do all the synthesis and everything. But when you're doing research, when you're trying to prove yourself as a researcher, usually you want to be showing people that you can design experiments, you can uh, you can ask the right questions, you can try to characterize the right parameters that actually is useful and of value to people and which is like publication quality. Uh, and from my experience, uh, generally, at least in my current lab, we have eight grad students and then one or two undergraduates working with each grad student. So that ratio, that number of people for one professor is quite large. So uh, undergraduates, generally, they're working with graduate students. And I've worked with, uh, on the next slide, I'll talk about numbers, but I've worked with plenty of uh, undergraduate students. Some of them get a chance to interact with the professors. Some of them, not as much, but it's fine. It's still, uh, like, usually there's a graduate student leading a project, in our lab at least. And so the undergraduates, they're there to help. They're there to help uh, with the bench work. And, but they're also welcome to pitch any ideas for experiments and things like that. Like that's always welcome. We have many ideas, many ways to take it. And having more perspectives on the same research really helps, even if you're just in a biochem class. Uh, bringing that, like sometimes biochemistry, like biochemistry is not my background, but I'm for some reason in a biochemistry lab. And it's really great to work with undergraduates currently in the class currently interacting with their professors and they'll even ask their professors questions that probably I can't answer sometimes and then they come back with like really great ideas but also in in the lab like I said I've met or I've trained a lot of students and mentored a lot of students and I'd say I'm pretty good friends with a lot of undergrads that I've worked with uh, and when you work in a lab you can uh, get your name on papers you can be co-authors with the grad students that you work with uh and if you're really independent and prove yourself you can also uh get your own project because that's happened in our lab before as well um so my advice for finding research opportunities definitely uh, you obviously have to start out by uh reaching out to the pi the primary investigator or the professor you'll hear those terms used interchangeably but the professors sometimes people call them pis uh, but that just means primary investigator of the project and reach out to them, whether it be by email, go ahead, uh, do email first. Uh, a lot of times I'm going to say a lot of professors do not reply to the emails, but that's shouldn't be a problem because uh, the next thing I would recommend is just walk into their office uh, or even give them a phone call. Not many people use the phone anymore, but you could also give them a phone call. Maybe they'll pick up. But also walking into the office if their door is open, if they have uh, posted office hours, because a lot of professors teach, you can check to see if they have posted office hours on their door. I've opened, I shouldn't use that metaphor. I've uh, I've uh, found a lot of opportunity by walking into people's doors. Uh, whether it be for research opportunity or just networking and connections. I kind of wanted to ask advice about uh, when I was an undergrad, I was definitely considering a nanotech program. And I knew there was a business professor on campus that worked with a lot of nanotech startups and companies. And so I found out, uh, I looked up her office number and location, and then I uh, went to the building and I noticed her door was open. I knocked on the door and we had a pretty long conversation about uh, different nanotech opportunities, different uh, uh, possibly even like internships and things like that. That was in New York because uh, I went to Syracuse University and that was, at Syrac that was in Syracuse. And there was actually at the time a lot of uh, startups and tax breaks and the governor was trying to bring in a lot of nanotechnology to the state and just walking into uh, somebody's office and talking about that. Like, and I learned a lot about what was going on. And I knew 
uh, that helped me decide like what type of graduate program I wanted to decide for myself because I knew that there was a lot of business popping up even in my home state which isn't very known for like uh, which isn't as comparable to like something like Silicon Valley in the industry there but still it's popping up like in a lot of places but also uh, being pushy when I say being pushy I mean uh i guess showing enthusiasm is a better way to put it uh but definitely constantly follow up show that you have interest because you're competing with other people uh who have also reached out but a lot of people that's the only thing they do is reach out they'll send an email they won't get a response and then that's their excuse for the rest of the semester is oh i i reached out but nobody uh nobody replied to me so that's the end of that story but if you reach out you follow up and you try to meet up with the professor in person like that makes you stand out a lot compared to other undergraduates because they most professors probably have a whole inbox full of undergrads and like professors are busy they have a lot of other obligations on campus uh lots of meetings they have to teach they have to write lectures they have to also be seeing there's students from class who are just trying to get help for class. Sometimes uh, there's no hard deadlines for research, and sometimes those obligations slip through the cracks because there are hard deadlines and uh, hard obligations for teaching. So sometimes that takes a little bit of priority over uh, like some research projects. But if you do show up, if you do uh, reach out, then you'll definitely uh you'll definitely stand out compared to other people in this in your same position who aren't reaching out and only emailing or not even reaching out in the first place and then like as you reach out you show that you have communication skills like you show that uh if you're not too pushy you you know how to calibrate the people you know how to work with people you want to be professional to people like all those things looks really great and all those things can definitely up your chances of uh finding an opportunity in a lab and if you do so happen to get a response i definitely talk to grad students in the lab you might end up working directly under a grad student rather than under the professor themselves but uh grad students like definitely talk to them some of them like you never know like who you're going to meet like i feel like most of the people i know in our program like everyone's had undergraduates i'd say most of the interactions are uh positive i don't really i can't really think of any negative experiences the worst thing that would happen is uh somebody doesn't like the lab and so they just uh stop showing up or maybe move on to another lab or something like that i think that's probably the worst thing that I can think of that's happened um but also talk to other undergrads if there are undergrads in the lab some labs if it's a new lab if there's few grad students uh maybe if they're not as well funded there may not be as many undergrads as graduate students but if there are like in our lab I'm gonna say we have probably a dozen undergrads and eight uh eight grad students in our lab so there's plenty of different people to talk to and also like each grad student are, they're probably doing completely different work uh and see like what they do what kind of interests you maybe have an idea uh read some papers from the lab see what types of techniques each lab uses like our lab in particular we have a lot of biological biology biological techniques but also chemistry techniques too and because of my engineering background i also bring a lot of like materials characterization techniques to the lab so when undergrads talk to me if that's something they're interested in like uh they should definitely sign up for probably a project that I'm associated with but if you're looking for uh more like cell work or something like that there's other graduate students in my lab that uh would definitely be a much better mentor and also uh check what projects they have ongoing if you're looking for a publication try to work with a grad student who just needs some extra hands with what project they're trying to wrap up because that was the case with me I was trying to wrap up I'm doing the three paper thesis option which is uh 
I write three first name author papers for my dissertation. And I had one last project to finish up and get out quick. And last summer I took on two undergrads and now both of them are going to have their name on the paper. And they just needed to help me finish things up. I had all the experiments. I had all the the outline of the paper finished. I just needed to finish uh, experimental repeats. And so some people were able to help with that. But it definitely depends. Um, you do need to contribute, depending on the project. There needs to be a lot of contribution to have your name on a paper. A lot of times it may just be an acknowledgement, which is still good. You can still put that in your res resume. But uh, if you're an author on a paper, that usually symbolizes you've done a significant amount of work. And that shows that's something you can brag about and put on your resume for uh, graduate school applications or just your next endeavor after college, uh, that you have your name on a paper because you contributed to it significantly. And then what to expect as an undergraduate in the lab? Uh, obviously, you're going to get experience in a lab environment. And... The reason that's a little bit underrated, because when you put that on your resume, uh, what you're going to realize when you work in a lab is it's a very chaotic environment. There's many, many things going on. A lot of things that you have to perform in lab are not user friendly. And so that has your ability to handle that has a lot of value in a real workplace, because a lot of workplaces I mean, it takes a lot to streamline uh, like an industry. It takes a lot to streamline a factory. And to make it uh, user friendly, like that's a lot of design. That's a lot of uh, work and uh, thought to go into it. But if you work in a lab environment, most lab environments, you're doing uh, research, you're doing things that people haven't done before. So there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things you have to combine you have to learn all these separate techniques. You have to perform all those separate techniques. And then you have to analyze all the data that you get from it afterwards. And so lab experience just shows that you can be functional in a chaotic environment. And when an employer sees that, if they if they know that they don't have the perfect work environment and say if uh, you continue to like industry and you do R&D in industry, like R&D and industry, maybe they have more money than academia, but it's still a chaotic environment. You still have to uh, basically design your day, design your work day. And uh, you have to know techniques and learn how to uh, basically innovate on the spot. And that's kind of what lab experience says on your resume is you can you can innovate, you can optimize things, uh, you can learn not so user-friendly techniques, and then you can take those techniques, apply it, and then learn valuable information that other people can, uh, and then also learn valuable information and then commu communicate it to other people. So lab experience, I think that looks really great on a resume, no matter where you go, honestly. Uh, because that also indicates that you work with people, you communicate with people. And even if you're not going to continue in like a lab setting, uh, it still speaks volume about your communication skills with people. And also uh, like in lab environments, there's you have to learn basic, not an entire new language, but you have to learn a lot about the science itself. And like there's abbreviations, like in our lab, there's abbreviations uh, for buffers and things like that and you have to learn all these new words and also be able to communicate it so when people listen to our conversations i know a lot of people get lost because there's all these acronyms going around and no one really knows uh like if you were just listening and you would have a lot of normal people wouldn't be able to follow but i've noticed that when undergrads when they spend a lot of time in our lab they start picking up on all of these abbreviations all these terms that we use all these weird verbs we use to describe things that don't even make any sense but people pick up on that and like we can have our almost like self-contained conversation and people 
uh, that aren't as experienced in lab or just are outsiders, like they don't really know what we're talking about. We sound crazy in public sometimes, but like those are the kind of experiences and like things you get good at when you work in a lab. And then I wrote here, oh, but also there's three different ways that I know of to uh, be a part of a lab, at least in the chemistry department. So this might vary from department to department, but uh, there's paperwork you can fill out and you can volunteer in the lab. And so that's a pretty low commitment. Uh, it's a low commitment type of uh, way to get experience. Uh, there's usually, I think there's a form in the chemistry main office you can fill out. And then there's a letter that you have to sign. But essentially, you can come in, volunteer your time, help us out with research. It's usually entails uh, being trained at first. So I guess it's more us investing in an undergrad more than an undergrad investing in us because we have to take the time to train. But I mean, I've trained uh, probably two dozen or more uh, undergraduates. Some of them stay, some of them don't. I wish all of them stayed because that's a big chunk of my time. But I, I'm i open to training a lot of people because when I do get a few good undergraduates, they're able, like, I have a few good undergraduates right now and they're a big help for me. And I'm glad I put in all that time to train two dozen people when I got like a few good workers out of it to help me, uh, to help me with finish up my projects, help me with bench work, help me with just like shooting ideas back and forth, having people to talk to and like, just have, like making friends too. So I think it's worth it. I take on as many, undergraduates as I can I, I love training personally uh definitely maybe not all graduate students love training but personally I do so and I've definitely uh not regretted it I've gotten a lot out of it by meeting good people that uh offer really good help in the lab and then uh typically after you volunteer uh you can apply for class credit if you know the professor uh and they agree to sign off it you can go straight to a class credit i know that might be required for some undergraduate programs but uh it's all about the conversation with the professor themselves and then they can approve a class credit and then some labs have paid positions right now we have one undergrad being paid right now i think for 20 hours a week and uh that's pretty rare it depends on the type of grant the labs have uh our our lab in particular this is my bias not biased opinion but uh, uh this is just my personal experience uh our lab brings in quite a bit of money so we're able to allocate money different ways and i think a big reason why we do uh why we want to pay undergrads because it looks good for one when we're advertising but two when we're applying for grants if we can tell people yeah we we uh we have enough grant money to pay undergraduates like that's pretty rare and that just speaks volumes about uh the quality of work and like the quality of work that the lab does and also the money that the lab brings in so it looks really great if uh we can actually afford to pay undergrads and that's like a great opportunity for somebody to have and then i put here practice 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 because a lot of i I can't really think of any lab that isn't like this, but lab work, it's complicated and it uh, it needs practice. When I'm training, when I'm training undergrads, people that only come in, say, like once a week for two hours, uh, it takes a long time to get to know the techniques and like to acclimate to the lab environment like i said it's a chaotic environment there's a lot of things going on uh there's a lot of people saying things that you might not understand and just coming in once a week you're kind of getting rusty for six days of the week and you come back and you spend maybe the first hour just trying to reacclimate yourself to the lab and the lab work and just the nature of research in general and then uh then you take another six days off come back reacclimate yourself so it's a slow it's a much slower process even if you spend a full day only coming in once a week it's like a skill you definitely have to practice it's like math or like learning an instrument or something like that uh 
consistency is pretty key. And it's much better, say, if you have eight hours a week, it's much better to come in like a few hours every day than it is just come in for a very long time in one day. So it's definitely a skill. And uh, another thing you can get out of it is publications. Like I said, we have a lot of papers where undergraduates are either acknowledged or they're on the author list itself. At the bottom here, uh, these are two examples of research articles where undergraduates are first author. That's, I'm going to say, exceedingly rare, but in, I think our lab started up in 2015. Uh, since then, like we've had two undergraduates, uh, they've uh, published two first name author papers, which is pretty big. That's sometimes that's uh, in some labs, a PhD student might publish one first name author paper. So we are a pretty high productive lab. We published, I think, 10 papers last year. I think we average like 12 per year, which is very high. Some labs only publish once a year. So it really depends on where you go. And that's definitely a question to ask. If you are looking for a publication, look for a lab that's uh, just churning out papers. That just depends on the field and the research that they do. But uh, yeah, uh, Allison Tran on the right, uh, I was able to help out with this project because you can see my name here. Uh, she's at Yale for uh, PA school. So she was able to get into Ivy League and having a first name author was definitely a huge help for that. But she put in a lot of time. I knew her like she she was in the lab constantly every day after class and between classes and contributed a lot of help. I know uh, she definitely a lot of grad students also helped her out. Uh, the three following authors, Morgan, Justin and me, we helped out a lot with experimental design uh, repeats and definitely the writing process too but Allie she put in a lot of work herself and like uh, provided a lot of materials and I joined the lab after this project had already started so she helped train me a little bit to get like myself on board into the project but yeah there's a lot of help from everybody but it was definitely uh, a lot of work for an undergraduate but Allie came in and did a lot and like she was able to get her name for her name on a paper and be first author at the same time. And then on the left here, I uh, this was before my time, but uh, we referenced this paper quite a bit. The journal is Advanced Functional Materials, and they're a very high impact journal. That's probably the highest impact journal that our group publishes in. I think it's uh, if you know anything about impact factors, it's like up in the 30s, I think so. Like this journal papers on average get cited quite a bit. So this paper itself has a lot of citations from other research groups referencing her work. And that just means your your uh the work that you did is very impactful. A lot of people are reading this and also uh continuing on it and referencing it in their work. But uh yeah so that's our group. Uh, it's a pretty big group. Like I said, we're a fairly large group. This is uh, undergraduates and graduate students. I said there's eight grad students currently. Uh, not everybody's here, actually, now that I realize it. Um, so we definitely need to update our photo. But yeah, these are graduate and undergraduate students. And down here, uh, it lists all of our different collaborators and our funding opportunities. So we're a very well connected lab. Definitely uh, ask about funding when you are looking for a lab. Uh, you don't need funding. My first lab that I did my master's degree in, we we had very little funding. But I mean, I kind of liked making our materials last as long as possible. There was a lot of consumables we had to make last. Um, but we we did as much as we could with what we had. And I like that was an experience in itself. Maybe it didn't, uh, maybe we weren't turning out as many papers as other labs were, but it was definitely a good way to learn how to work with very little. Because right now in our lab, like I said, we have a lot of funding. It feels a little wasteful at times, but it's, uh, it is nice to be able to publish as much as we do. But it's also nice to be able to learn how to like, research meagerly and like make make use of what you have but anyways that's pretty much all i have to say 
Uh, we have a really good lab website. There's a QR code for that. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. We're trying to update that a little more often. I think we also started a TikTok for some reason. I don't, I don't have a QR code for that, but if you just search a phone and lab TikTok, maybe you can find some. I think we've only got two TikToks so far, but uh, we're trying to delve into a little more of uh, uh, like social media metrics because for some reason that uh, the a lot of uh, publishing journals they they're looking into seeing how many people tweet out tweet out research papers because that's a big way to get uh, a lot of the information out there and to spread a lot of research is through Twitter now. But anyways, yeah, we're trying to increase our social media presence. And then if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. On the right side, that's my QR code. Um, I just recently, I updated my LinkedIn a couple months ago, but I feel like it's already out of date now, just based on how much we published in the past month and the things that I'm doing recently to try and finish up. But yeah, take a look at my LinkedIn and please send me a request. I, I've, uh, I love building my network on LinkedIn because a lot of times there's people I want to connect with in other cities and they won't let me because I don't have, they're not in like my second circle or something. So the bigger the network, the better. So please reach out there. And if, even if you're not interested in talking, just reach out and we can, uh, we can share our circles and make our network a little bigger. But yeah, that's all I really have. Thank you guys for the opportunity to present here and thank you everyone for your kind attention. Damien, thank you. I mean, just sitting here, I learned a ton <laughs> and I'm, not on the research track, but it's incredible all that you covered in terms of the experience, but also what to expect and what to put into it. There's so much to it. And the fact that I love how you mentioned how chaotic it is. You know, some people think people who do lab work, it's very quiet and quaint, but, you know, clearly you state otherwise. Um, so creating that picture is so helpful for students. So I'll open up the door here to students. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or unmute your, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, unmute your mic and ask a question directly to Damien. I have a Go ahead. question. I have a question about, um, is it like too late in the semester to ask to, be in a professor's lab? Like when should I have started? I mean, anytime we'll take, uh, you can join up on a lab pretty much anytime during the semester. It's a pretty, um, the timing is pretty informal. Like obviously working in a lab, that's a professional thing to do, but the timing itself, it's not really, like research goes on all year round. It doesn't matter what time, in the semester it is it doesn't matter if it's summer research is always happening generally we get a lot of people during the summer uh just because there's less classes going on but i'm sure there's less people looking for lab work now but uh most labs it doesn't matter from our perspective it doesn't matter what time of the semester it is okay thank you yeah no problem what kind of hours, and I understand you said that might be based on year in school or interest. How many hours do people average maybe at the undergraduate level? Undergrads, I mean, yeah, it definitely varies. Like I said, some people come in two hours a week, one time. Um, it, that's, that's a little bit of a slower process. Yeah. But some people, some people show up five days a week for like an hour okay that's quite a bit better even if it's a little bit it's only a little bit more than double the time but I say that's much more fruitful than only coming in once a week uh some try hard students like they'll be here 20 hours a week those are some of the students that definitely get their name on a paper yeah uh like I said uh I knew Allie she was a first name author paper she was in here probably more than 20 hours a week Gotcha. And then, yeah, she uh, helped worked weekends too. Depends on the lab. Uh, weekends is a little bit weird because uh, 
grad students may not be here. I'm usually here on the weekends. So my grads or my undergrads that work with me, uh, if they're willing, like we'll work on the weekends, no problem. But uh, depends on the uh, grad student or the professor that the undergrad is working with, whether or not they're here on the weekends. But hours wise, uh, in between classes, you can build up like an hour every day, I think, pretty easily. Okay. And that's uh, if you're doing good work, uh, that's uh, really helpful to the lab and is you can, I would say, at least in our lab, you can definitely get your name on a paper with hours like that. And uh, is there standardization in terms of roles, even though I know you said it's chaotic just because things change, there's constant information sharing, discoveries, et cetera. Are there kind of standard protocols when working in a lab that people can expect, or is it just like, we need you here, go? I mean, our lab, yes, we have protocols written out. Uh, we have a lot of repetitive things to do. Uh, like we run polymerase chain reaction the same way every time, and we need a lot of uh, P PCR product from that. So we do that at least somebody's doing that on a daily basis so yeah uh we have a like we make stickers we have because in research you have to keep a very good lab notebook mm -hmm. if you're keeping if you're intending to publish data you want to make sure you have all the details written out and recorded in a notebook and because we do pcr so many times we have stickers that has the protocol written out and then you can just stick it in your notebook but that's what uh, that's what we do is we just follow sticker protocols. We have written protocols. I can't say every lab is like that. My uh, the lab I worked for my master's, there was no standard protocol. I kind of figured out the uh, I kind of figured out the ceramic processing protocol, and then I showed it to everybody. Uh, I never really got a chance to completely write it out until we were publishing the paper. So you can. Uh, you can look at previous publications from labs and see a lot of the protocols they'll write out. Mm -hmm. But depending, it depends on the lab. Our lab, yes, definitely we have protocols written out. Yeah, uh, there's almost nothing in the lab to do besides experiment design. All the procedures are pretty much standardized in our lab. Cool. But can't say that for every lab. True. Yeah. Understand that. Any definitely. Go ahead. So definitely uh, designing experiments. There's no, there's no standard for that. Uh, you kind of have to choose for yourself what information is going to be valuable for research, and what inform what questions should you be asking, and what uh, what type of data should you be looking for? That's something that I think can't be standardized at all. That's always like a project by project basis. But I mean, that's kind of like why you're doing the project. You're coming up with a story to publish and tell people. Uh, we ran these experiments so we can generalize knowledge about, say, like a molecule or something like that. It's that's what research is, is making generalized statements about things. Our cells respond this way to this treatment. And you can say that in a general statement. And you now other people can go off of that and find out even more things and then make better therapeutics or at least uh, what, what am I trying to say here? Like when you make generalizable information, uh, that's the goal of research, but then that generalizable information, you can go on to further develop uh, more research and more therapeutics in our case. Yeah, makes sense. Any other questions from the student side? I didn't want to monopolize. Okay. We have recorded this session. For any reason, students, you want to go back and watch for any more detail, we post that to our YouTube channel. 
And Damien, I can't thank you enough. I have learned so much in the last 40 minutes. <laughs> And I uh, appreciate you sharing that wealth of knowledge and, and making sense of it. I think that's also a huge piece when we're trying to educate students on what's next and you know what you do and, and how that impacts everything around you. So thank you. This means a lot to us and I really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, no problem. And thank you students for taking the time to be part of this program as well. I hope everyone has a great day and we have other events planned. So we have a couple more left today and hopefully you can join some of those. Take care guys. Thank you. Thanks Damien, thanks everyone.